Good morning morning. to everyone here and those worshiping with us online. There are a lot of activities coming up this coming week and beyond, and please refer to your bulletin for those, and I'll highlight just a few. Uh, Tomorrow evening, Monday, Cake It Easy is having its first online dessert fundraiser. There will be 10 evenings of yummy cakes on the block, so check your Facebook, check the church Facebook page for all your information. And just a reminder and an update, the new heat pump has been installed, and you're being invited to help with the expenses by picking up a heat the hall envelope, which you'll find at the back of the sanctuary, and each envelope is marked with a dollar amount and thanks in advance for your help. And I'd also ask you to please take time to read about the Affirming Ministries process, which you'll find in your bulletin, and to consider being a part of an information meeting. And if you're interested, please be in touch with Reverend Mary Beth. Also, please take note in your bulletin, there's information on a guaranteed livable income, or GLI. The schedule for the Holy Week is in your bulletin as well, Palm Sunday, April the 2nd. And Good Friday ecumenical service is at St. Andrews this year. And after the service, we will be gathering at the McCullough House Hill to erect the cross and for short prayers. Easter sunrise service is gathering again at the McCullough House Hill and then a light breakfast in the genealogy center. And here at 10.30 on Easter Sunday morning, Easter Cantata, the triumph song of life. Are there any announcements that I've missed that should be made?
probably 6.15ish, 6.30. You're very welcome. We'll see you there. <laughs> <laughs> and our, our congregation family would like to extend our prayers and condolences to Ann Ferguson and her family on the passing of her sister. This Lent, oh, excuse me, before I start. <laughs> At the top of your bulletin, there's always a little preamble about what we're, what we're doing and what we're about in this service. And this Sunday's no different. And it says, called by God as disciples of Jesus, the United Church of Canada seeks to be a bold, connected, evolving church of diverse, courageous, hope-filled communities united in deep spirituality, inspiring worship, and daring justice. And our reflections this morning are going to speak to that commitment of our United Church. This Lent, as we enter our time of worship, we intentionally pause as we acknowledge the land upon which we worship. We know that land acknowledgments are not enough on their own. It is, however, one way to be public, intentional, and explicit in working towards reconciliation. As we gather in this place, we pause and remember and acknowledge that we live, work, play, and worship on the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by treaties of peace and friendship, first signed with the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet and Passamaquoddy First Nations prior to 1779. We respectfully acknowledge that we are all treaty people. We commit ourselves to the ongoing work of reconciliation and right relations as we listen, learn, relearn, and live the call of our faith to the sacred ways of peace and justice for all our relations. Why? That is the question. Why are we here? Is it convention, a loyalty to the traditions of our parents? Our parents were guides, but being here is our choice. Is it habit, the practice of a lifetime? Habits we perform without thinking, but being here is our choice. Is it friendship? the tie to others. These ties bind us, but being here is our choice. We choose to come for our lives to be transformed for the transformation of the world. Let us come and worship God.
Please join with me in the gathering prayer. Living God, may we open our hearts to you, moving beyond all that clutters our lives and all that is waiting for our attention. May your spirit calm us amid the chaos and tune our ears to hear your voice above all else, calling us to find our center in you. May your spirit guide us in our busyness, the expectations of community, the needs of our world, the necessary demands of ministry. Help us to let them be for a while. Move us deeper into your presence, where we can be fully attentive to the wisdom of our faith tradition, the stirrings of your spirit, the insights of others, the gifts of this time and each day. our church and this book is called the family book and all those people out there every single one of them belong to our what family church family right every single one of them love us be better for us and they love seeing your faces here where well, you never miss us do you so tell me about your family Sarah or Jamie or Jamie <laughs> what about your family who's part of it I am yeah um, are there, is 27. It, there's 27. 27 in our family. We counted them in here. Yeah, 27. So when we all get together, it's kind of noisy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Especially yes. Leland and Sarah. And right. Yes. Leland and Sarah kind of, they really can make it crazy. Can make it crazy. So it's, family time. So this is a book about family. And the very first one, very first page says, some families are big. We have a big family. Some families are small. I'm sure your, some of your friends have just small families, right? And then, some families are the same color. Some families are different colors, and this is like, here we have fish, and they're all different. They're yellow, green, green, yellow, purple, purple. Okay, so the different colors. All families like to hug each other. There, yeah, we like to hug each other. Oh, I know somebody's not going to be happy with that. And there's the bears hugging. Are they bears? Yes. yes. Some families live near each other. All of us. You live just down the road from me. My name is right across the street. Right. But some families live 
She's going to visit with you. You look like your mom a lot. Okay. I think there's people in here that have children that look like them too. Some families look like their pets. <laughs> Do you look like Groot? No. No. All families are sad when they lose someone they love. You know that. Some families have a stepmom or stepdad or stepsisters or stepbrothers. Some families adopt children. Some families have two moms and two dads. Some families have one parent instead of two. All families like to celebrate special days together. Birthdays. Birthdays. Turkey dinner. dinner. Easter dinner's coming up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some families eat the same things. Well, we're pretty good at that. We eat. We're picky. We're picky. Right? Okay. Some families eat different things. The dog has the bone, the cat has the fish, and the rabbit has a carrot. like to be quiet. We're not quiet. We're not quiet. We're not quiet. We're quiet. <laughs> Some families like to be noisy. We like to be noisy. Some families like to be clean. All of us. Some families like to be messy. Some families share a house with other families. That would be like an apartment building, wouldn't it? All families can help each other be strong. We've done that, haven't we? There are lots of different ways to be a family. Your family is special. No matter what kind it is, love Todd. Todd must be author of the book. So, we've talked about families, but all of these families were basically talking about actual families, weren't they? But then we have all of these people here that are a church family. They are, aren't they? They like seeing you here in church. They love it when you sing Waverly, or, yeah, now I think that Lloyd is going to play a song and you're going to sing again and then you're going down with Jeannie to Sunday school.
deep spirituality, bold discipleship, daring justice, a reflection of celebration. Grace was completing an exercise with the confirmation class. The confirmation program involved a monthly session with youth in grade nine and their mentors. Each young person was partnered with an adult in the congregation. Bill was one of the mentors. They attended monthly sessions together and then had a second meeting with just the two of them, following the outline that explored the subject of the class further. All class activities were undertaken by both youth and their mentors. Early in the session on prayer, Grace invited them to take their place along a line. At one end of the line were those who never prayed outside of worship, and at the other were those who prayed daily. It was Grace's experience that even the youth often fell in the middle. Many of them had been taught bedtime childhood prayers that they sometimes still recited. What Grace was not prepared for was one of the adults, one of the mentors, to land at never. But that was what Bill did. Bill was a retired educator that Grace recruited as a mentor because he was skilled at drawing out young people who were there because their parents had forced them to be. Bill would connect with them and they would attend and participate. Bill was also a trustee and a member of the church council. He had words of wisdom and insight in each of these settings and Grace valued his point of view. Most Sundays, he attended worship. Bill also had a grandchild who had needed a heart transplant before its first birthday, so his experience with stress was firsthand. But here he was sharing that he never prayed. To be fair to Bill, Grace suspected he was more typical than atypical of the men of his generation. Many years earlier, one of her predecessors had held monthly men's lunch where the men in the congregation shared a meal and discussed a topic. But that had long ended. Unless they attended a study group, there was little opportunity for men to gather and pray beyond worship compared to the opportunity that UCW had once provided women for their spiritual growth. Once the shock passed, dismay took its place. Grace wondered, how had the church so failed Bill in that he had not been given the tools to draw close to God? That's what spirituality is, drawing close to God. In worship, we do that cooperatively as a congregation. But what tools do we have to do it privately? Prayer is certainly one. Prayer is opening our lives to God. It can be with words or through music or using many other forms. For some people, it is solitude in nature. For others, it is quieting and settling themselves with the tools like meditation or mandalas, the original adult coloring activity. For Bill, it was worship and that experience formed him into a man dedicated to serving his church. I wonder how much more personal that experience may have been for him if he had had other tools, like one of the forms of prayer or a group with whom to study to deepen his intimacy with God. What our new mission statement says is that this experience of intimacy with God is the starting point for each of us it is grounded in worship and prayer, study and scripture. Deep spirituality is the joy of those who know they are loved and held by God and who long to run into God's embrace. Deep spirituality is the cornerstone of our identity, not just as a church, but also as individuals.
Hear the words of the psalmist. A reading from Psalm 139. God, the Eternal One, you know me. You know me as I take my rest and as I rise again. You know my most distant thoughts. You trace my journey and all of my pathways. My whole life is open to you. Before a word comes out of my mouth, you know it. Your presence seems to every side, behind and before, and every now and again, you lay your hand on me. All this is just too wonderful. How can I possibly understand it? I know that there is nowhere I can go to escape your presence. Therefore, I find comfort that you know me as you do, that you test me and try my thoughts. But watch me, lest I take a wrong path. Lead me forward in a life where I will know for sure I am accepted and blessed. Reflections, bold, bold disciplineship. One of the movies in which Lawrence Fishburne acts is Aquila and the Bee. Fishburne is a teacher who commits to work with 11-year-old Aquila to prepare her to compete at the National Spelling Bee. Aquila is keen to preserve this, but partway through the preparation, she loses focus. Fishburne has set her a task of memorizing boxes of words, and she's rather bored with the whole enterprise. Her approach leads him into a discussion of discipline that forever changed my understanding of disciplineship. Fishburne explains that discipline is what gives life to meaning. The word discipline, like the word disciple, comes from the Latin discipulus, meaning pupil. Like discipline, Disciplineship is the act of giving life to learning. If spirituality is intimacy with God, then disciplineship is how the intimacy shapes us. Disciplineship is where our understanding of God connects with our lives. Let us listen to a gospel story from John's Gospel, John 2, verses 1 to 11. Three days later, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was at a wedding feast in the village of Canaan in Galilee. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited and were there. When the wine was all gone, Mary said to Jesus, They don't have any more wine. Jesus replied, Mother, my time hasn't come yet. You must not tell me what to do. Mary then said to the servants, do whatever Jesus tells you to do. At the feast, there were six stone water jars that were used by the people for washing themselves in the way that the religion said they must. Each jar held about a hundred liters. Jesus told the servants to fill them to the top with water. Then after the jars had been filled, he said, now take some water and give it to the man in charge of the feast. The servants did as Jesus told them, and the man in charge drank some of the water that had now turned into wine. He did not know where the wine had come from, but the servants did. He called the bridegroom over and said, The best wine is always served first. Then after the guests that had had plenty, the other wine is served. But you have kept the best until last. This was Jesus' first miracle, and he did it in the village of Canaan in Galilee. 
There Jesus showed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. This is a story about discipleship. Here, Jesus is called to leave his private life and take up his public ministry. He has been in the community as the son of Joseph. He has cared for his mother and his younger siblings, who at this point appear to have been raised. He attends a wedding, and when the wine runs out, his mother nudges him. Has she been watching from the sidelines, wondering when he would take up his calling? She believed he had. Has she been worried that his sense of family obligation is standing in the way of his future? Has she sensed a restlessness in him? Jesus is none too happy about her prodding. He appears to be willing to continue as is, with a quiet life not much different from that of his neighbors. But whether it is his mother's prompting or his own yearnings, the moment has come when Jesus needs his life to reflect his identity, and he changes the water into wine. It's a turning point of his life, or as the writer of John calls it, it's the first of his miracles. This is often how we speak about call as though it is a dramatic moment where life changes completely. Consequently, we often only discuss call for people like ministers, pastors, or lay people whose lives are obviously shaped by a decision born of faith. But we do a disservice when we do that. We miss seeing how our personal stories are connected to God's holy story. Let's consider Mona. Mona was a woman of deep faith, but I suspect if you asked her what her calling was, she would have fumbled for an answer. From the outside, it was obvious. Mona fed people. She was forced to leave school early to care for her younger sister due to her own mother's illness. When she left home, it was to work as a domestic. Then she served in the Navy as an officer's cook. After the war, she was responsible for the cashiers in a Toronto-based chain of supermarkets. When she quit working to have a family, apart from caring for her children and entertaining others, she was always the person in charge of meals at church, fundraising meals, celebratory meals, and so forth. In fact, when friends described the church as God's house, one of the youngsters, a three-year-old, asked if Mona, if Mona also cooked God's meals. Long before the practice was widespread, Mona was part of initiatives to make sure struggling families had the supplies they needed for a Christmas feast. In every experience in her life, she was devoted to helping people have the nourishment they needed. Surely that is just as sacred a calling to serve as an ordained minister. Discipleship is seeing how our lives are sacred, are a sacred calling, and out of our faith, connected our gifts into the world's needs. Discipleship is how our lives become avenues of God's love and presence in the world. Let us not be hesitant in understanding or embracing that rather but to rather hold on and claiming every moment of every day and every activity as an expression of how God is caring for the world through us.
In the Bible, especially in the Hebrew scriptures, two words are often paired, righteousness and justice. Righteousness is to be in the right relationship with God. Righteousness is the experience of deep spirituality and bold discipleship. It is the bond between God and us that shapes our lives. Justice is the bond between God and God's people that shapes the world. Justice is what moves faith from the individual experience of me in my small corner to all of us, the church together in the world. If discipleship is what shapes our lives, justice is what shapes our world. Justice is when each of us brings our different gifts together as one. Justice is living as a body of Christ as described in Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. Hear these words from 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1 to 11. <clears throat> Excuse me. My friends, you asked me about spiritual gifts. I want you to remember that before you became followers of the Lord, you were led in all the wrong ways by idols that cannot even talk. Now I want you to know that if you are led by God's Spirit, you will say that Jesus is Lord and you will never curse Jesus. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but they all come from the same spirit. There are different ways to serve the same Lord, and we can each do different things. Yet the same God works in all of us and helps us in everything we do. The Spirit has given each of us a special way of serving others. Some of us can speak with this wisdom, while others can speak with knowledge, but these gifts come from the same Spirit. To others, the Spirit has given great faith or the power to heal the sick or the power to work mighty miracles. Some of us are prophets. Some of us recognize when God's Spirit is present. Others can speak different kinds of languages, and still others can tell what these languages mean. But it is the Spirit who does all this and decides which gifts to give to each of us. Although this selection from 1 Corinthians ends with a list of gifts, what follows is the famous passage where Paul likens the church to a body, noting that a body needs many parts, just as the body of Christ needs many gifts. Justice is when the gifts of God's people come together to seek the transformation of the world. Justice is when United Church people and United Church congregations work together to sponsor refugees in response to the Syrian crisis. Justice is when United Church people and congregations support Canadian Food Grains Bank to enable to be able to provide food in emergency situations and to promote long-term food security around the globe. Justice is when United Church people and congregations admit our painful role in the residential schools and commit to reconciliation. While Canadians may have been both shocked and surprised by unmarked graves, I think many United Church folks only had their worst fears confirmed. We already knew how destructive residential schools had been and what a painful chapter our participation in them is in our life as a church. Justice is when United Church people and congregations mark in pride parades and speak out against the violence suffered by two-spirit and LGBTQ plus communities. Justice is when our response is collective and transformative. Justice is bringing our different gifts together to move the world closer to God's intention for fullness of life for all. Daring justice is when we respond to the world in faith, not out of fear. Many congregations are mired in fear because of the future of communities of faith in general and of the community they love in particular are uncertain. Their decisions become guided by what evolves the least 
risk, the least risk of upsetting someone, the least risk to their financial stability, the least risk on many different fronts. Daring justice is the call to be found together in faith and to respond together in faith, not fear. So, let us be daring as we glimpse God's vision for a world transformed, trusting that the God we know so well, whose ways we seek to follow, will not forsake or forget us, but will dare us to leave our fears behind to be in the world as people of deep spirituality, bold discipleship, and daring justice. We are a people of deep spirituality, a passionate people seeking to grow into God's deeper presence. We are a people of bold discipleship, a hope-filled people believing in possibilities and promise. We are a people of daring justice, a people of convictions seeking to make a difference. We believe that God is at work in us and through us. Within the congregation of Picta United Church, we are committed to providing a place and atmosphere that will enhance spiritual growth and encompass all ages. Celebrating and nurturing our Christian faith through meaningful worship and music enhancing a spirit of fellowship and faith development through events and programs that acknowledge and affirm the gifts and talents of all, sharing with God in ministries of care and outreach within and beyond the community to create a just world for all. Blessed be, blessed are we,
time when we give thanks for all the gifts that we have been given that we share in this United Church, Pictou United Church family. It's uh, always a pleasure to work on different committees and things because everybody is, is, uh, takes you for what you are <laughs> and are very loving. And we, and we appreciate everyone who is on a committee, who works to make Pictou United Church a true family. Good morning. Dear Eternal One, as we come today, we are grateful for your presence in our church. We lift up the legacy of those who have gone before us, and we humbly pray for your guidance in the new paths you are forging ahead for us. We now pause to recognize our failing. We have not been as you have called us to be. We say united, yet we are broken in so many places. We say diversity is welcome, yet those who are different, different struggle to find their place. We say forgive us, yet we seem to find it hard to forgive. Quietly speak to our hearts, Divine One. You are the potter in whose hands we now yield. Break us and mold us into what you want us to be. Fill us with your spirit and give us new utterings. May we profess with joy in seeking to collaborate and mend our church and our world, invigorate our leadership in steering us to bold discipleship, embrace equity and sustainability in our resources, Live out our climate commitments. Be humble and confident in sharing our faith. And work towards the strengthening of the Indigenous Church initiatives. This we pray in the name of the one who guides our path.
We are blessed and we are called to be a blessing. Remember, our highest calling is to be the church. So with deep spirituality, be brave, beloved. In bold discipleship, be blessed, beloved. For daring justice, be bold, beloved. Be God's, be brave, be Christ, you bold, and be spirit, the spirits, you blessed.